our voices. All hail King Jesus. All hail Emmanuel. King of kings, Lord of lords, bright morning star. And throughout eternity, I'll sing His praises. you those are the people that are going to be reigning reigning not r-a-i-n like we've been having all this rain but r-e-i-g-n reigning i wonder what i'm going to be in charge of you ever think about that i had a good friend that uh, worked at bell south she said when i get to heaven i'm going to be charged of alphabetizing everybody's names to get everybody in the right spot i don't think it's going to be that but we're going to have an incredible time in heaven I can't wait to get there. Loved ones that have gone before, I can't wait to get, come face to face with Jesus Christ and to thank him for the blood that he shed on my behalf. You know, that's the reason that we're here this morning, is that we, we come to proclaim the gospel of Christ once again, to remember that God's got everything under control. He's already won the victory. That was won at Calvary over 2,000 years ago. Amen? Let's celebrate the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Let's sing together this beautiful hymn, All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name.
Just imagine, just as we just sang that song with just your voices, is just a tiny little glimpse of what glory will be like. And singing forth the praises of our Father forever and ever. Amen? Amen. Let's go to the throne. Father God, Lamb of God, there is no other name given among men whereby we must be saved but the name of Jesus Christ. There is no one more worthy than you. So God, this morning, may we not store up treasures for ourselves, 
But God, may we store up treasures where neither moth nor rust can destroy. God, may we bring the full tithe into the storehouse this morning. God, so that we can go out into Henry County, we can go out into a Georgia, into around the world, God, proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. This offering is not about us. It is about what you have already done. So, Father, take this offering and use it for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. of the Lord. We'll let the choir get out before we get started this morning. Uh, let me remind you that we do have five o'clock worship this afternoon. I hope you'll join us for a time of uh, worship at five o'clock. Uh, this is the year we hope and pray of revival and awakening. Um, there is a, there's a mighty move of the Lord across uh, 
our state? Are we see pockets of movements of uh, the Lord across our state? And uh, this year uh, in 2016 is um, the cry for revival, the cry for awakening. And that's our heart and that's our theme and that's what we're praying about and that's what we're looking to. The cry for revival, the outcry of God's people for a fresh touch from heaven. November the 6th through the 9th. We're going to say this a lot. I want you to pray about that. I want you to pray about the meeting. I want you to pray about those that are coming. That the Lord would bless in a special way. I want you to block those dates off on your calendar. And you won't let the world determine what you do that week. But you will predetermine already that November the 6th through the 9th, you're going to come to Bethany and be a part of our revival meeting with Life Action Ministries. I would share with you that they had a meeting in, in uh, Reno, Nevada uh, just a few months ago in a church there. Reno, very, very bad place. The presence and power of God was so strong that some brothels got closed. Now, man, that's God working. But a one-week meeting turned into five weeks because the presence of the Lord was so powerfully strong in that place. I want to tell you, there's a hunger and a desperation for God to move across our land as never before. And uh, it, it, it needs to happen in us. It needs to happen with us. And so Life Action Ministries, believing and sensing that God is moving in the state of Georgia for the first time ever in the history of their ministry, is focusing upon the state of Georgia. And our, uh, our heart is for revival. And uh, they're putting all their resources and all their people in the state of Georgia to help See if they can be catalysts and vessels through which God would use to bring revival. And they're coming here November the 6th through the 9th, 2016, to help lead us in revival. So we have to pray our, prepare our heart, and we'll be working on that in the days to come. But we want you to be praying about that now and preparing your heart now for what God will do during those days. Yesterday was a great day. We had upwards. If you were involved in Upward yesterday, would you just say, hey, preacher, I was involved. Let's just give me a wave up here. Would you do that? It was great. There were some people that got here real early on Saturday morning, and they stayed 7.30, 8 o'clock Saturday night. They had a long day. But God's good. Would you express a word of appreciation to all of our volunteers? A great, great time. I just want to ask you to do something. So many people that are involved in Upwards particularly the kids and the parents, so many of those folks are not connected to a church anywhere. And we need you to pray that the Lord would use us as uh, instruments to touch those people and to introduce them to Jesus and invite them to come to our church and uh, find the Lord and the love of God. And so you pray for our upwards, go through the end of February. And so yesterday was a great day. That was the first day. And there'll be many good days to come. But, you know, the further the season gets along, the body gets tired and because uh, it is demanding. And so you pray for the leaders that they not uh, lose heart and uh, get weary in well-doing. But we might be faithful to do that which God's called us to do. I want you to look in the book of James, chapter 4. And uh, I want to talk today about a friend of God. A friend of God. The scripture is James, chapter 4. What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you suppose that it is no purpose that the scripture says he yearns jealousy over the spirit that he might make dwell, he might dwell in us. But he gives more grace, therefore it says God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. 
Submit yourself, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. Do not speak evil against one another, brothers. The one who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks evil against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is only one lawgiver and judge. He who is able to save and to destroy. But who are you to judge your neighbor? Pray the Lord would bless us and bless his word today. Most of us in this room today would be quick to acknowledge, I am a friend of God. And we sing that song, I am a friend of God. I am a friend of God. We say it again, I am a friend of God. He calls me friend. And yet James is very clear. You can't be connected to the culture and the world intimately and be a friend of God. And if you are a friend of God, intimate, intimate rock with God, you will not be a friend of the world. Here's the dilemma that we live in. We live in a world that is becoming more and more ever increasing secular, materialistic um, culture fo- focused upon self-gratification. That's the world we live in. How is it possible that we can live in the world and not be of the world? How is it possible that we can be in the world and yet not become so much like the world that, get, that we can be a friend of God? These are challenging times and challenging days in which we live. And James' accusation to the church that he's writing and to the churches that would read his letter is that you, the people of God, have become worldly. You become worldly and and your life is driven not by the power and the passion of the Holy Spirit. You're not living spiritually directed lives under the authority of the Lordship of Jesus Christ. But you're living lives directed by the culture, directed by the world, according to the dictates of your heart and the gratifications within your inner being that they might be gratified, the desires of your heart. And so he says, why do you think you're quarreling with one another? Why do you think you're fighting and debating with one another? Why do you think you're getting caught up in heated debate with one another? And he's talking about the church and people in the church. Because you're living your life according to the dictates of your heart and the preferences and the desires of your heart that are not connected in an intimate way with a walk with Jesus. In other words, you're making all your choices based on your heart that's more fleshy than it is spiritual. And so in our culture, there's a raging power that drives us to be gratified, self-gratification. And men and women are dying for their pleasures. And James is addressing a church, and he's talking about members of the body of Christ who are more pleasure-seeking than they are God-seeking. They're seeking after pleasure. And when you're seeking after pleasure and self-gratification, there arises in your heart and in your spirit chronic hostility and sharp confrontations with those who oppose you and whose views and ideas are different than your own. So he says, you can't have what you want, so you quarrel. You can't have what you want, so you murder and you kill and you steal. Because you're living by the dictates of your own heart. 
In essence, what he's saying that each and every person's pleasure and preference is more important to them than anything else. I think I would be safe to say today that uh, to a great degree, the worship wars so often were driven by personal preferences than anything else. And it cuts across the grain of every generation. No one's excluded. It's what I want. It's what I prefer. It's what I like. It's what I think. And if you disagree with me, then there's debate. So it's the pursuit of self-gratification <coughs> that leads to confusion in the church and disaster. And the obsession with one's own personal pleasures then betrays our friendship with God. Have you ever been betrayed by a friend? I think all of us at some point, maybe in time in life, <clears throat> have, have experienced maybe that betrayal. Somebody's let us down. Somebody's disappointed us. Somebody's hurt us. You know how that feels? Remember how that feels? Well, that's what we do to Jesus. That's what we do with God. In essence, what he's saying is our obsession with our own pleasures and desires betrays our friendship with God. So such worldliness calls for us to repent. Now you notice what he says in this chapter. He says there's quarreling and there's arguing and there's debate and there's confusion among you. In essence, what he's saying, listen to me, church, you are guilty of committing spiritual adultery. That's, that's what he's talking about. It's a hard word. It's not a, it's not a fun word. It's not a good word. Good thing here. You're guilty of spiritual adultery. That's the problem. And your spiritual adultery, living your life according to the dictation of your heart and having a desire for the world and the things of this world more than a desire to be intimate in your walk with God, hinders your relationship with God, but it also hinders your relationship with your brother and your sister. Let me tell you, if my relationship with God is out of sort and out of whack, then it's very easy for my relationship to get out of sort and get out of whack with you. But because the only way I can love you the way I ought to love you is through the love of God. So often we think, well, I got a problem with Bob or I got a problem with Jane and I got a problem with Bill or whoever. And the real source of it is not the problem with that individual. It's the fact that we're out of fellowship with God. Why can't I forgive? Why can't I extend grace? Why can't I be merciful? Because I'm out of fellowship with God. We've committed spiritual adultery. And did you notice in the passage he said this? If you're committing spiritual adultery, you can pray and pray and pray all you want, and you're just wasting your breath. I mean, you're praying and you're offering prayers and you're asking for stuff and you're asking for things, but what is the motive of your praying? Is it out of a broken, contrite heart that you're praying for the glory and the unction of God? Or is the course of your praying and the nature of your praying is that you might have the passion and desires of your heart met and those desires are more worldly than they are godly? He says, you pray and you pray and you pray and nothing's happening. And you can't pray and have connection with God if you're out of fellowship with God. And you can't pray and have connection with God if you're out of fellowship with your brother. And you can pray and pray pray all you want. But if the motive of your praying is not for the honor and glory of God, you're wasting your breath. Nothing happens. You pray and pray, but you want to enjoy that for yourself. It's not about the glory of God. The motives of our praying are wrong. And so you see... If, if you look at the church in North America, if you look at the church in the West, and we wonder, why is there such declension? Why is there such decline? Why don't we see the <clears throat> mighty move of God and His Spirit across our land and across our churches and in our churches? Would it be safe to say it's because we're at enmity with God? Because if we desired God and intimacy with Him as much as we desired those things of this world, we might see a mighty move of God. 
Case in point. How do you know if, if you become an enemy of God and not a friend of God? Well, how much time do you spend in the Word of God each week, each day? Uh, let's find out. You, you know, I, I mentioned in the uh, 8.30 service, if the first thing you pick up, pick up in the morning and read is the AJC, it may be an indication that you're more worldly than you are spiritual. Because the first thing you ought to put your eyes on every morning ought to be the Word of God. And then I realized I was talking to a, a younger generation, and so I had to backtrack and say, maybe if the first thing you're ever putting on, on, in front of your face every morning is Facebook or social media, maybe you have become very worldly and sucked into the culture because that's what you spend your time in the morning doing instead of spending your time with God. See, there, 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 there are ways we can test to see if we're worldly. And if there's no desire for God and there's no hunger for God and if we're not desiring holiness and we're not desiring righteousness and we're not desiring to walk on a highway of holiness and we're not desiring to know God's heart and we're not desiring to know not God's mind and we're not desiring to see a mighty move of God across our land and in our homes and in our families and in our marriages and upon our children, it might be an indication that our hearts have slowly, slowly, slowly grown callous and indifferent and we don't even know it. Like the frog in the kettle. You can put a frog in a pan of water and then turn on the heat. And he just sits there and boils to death. Now, if you put him immediately in a pan of hot water, he'd jump out. But slowly but surely, he gets acclimated to the temperature and what's happening. And before long, he's consumed by it. That's what's happening in our world. We're here and we're being consumed by our culture to think like they think, to act like they act, to respond like they respond, to think like they think. And yet the scripture says we're to seek those things which are above where Christ Jesus sits at the right hand of God the Father. But if we're this worldly, we have no desire to seek those things which are above. And James says... You've committed spiritual adultery. And you can't connect to your brother or sister because you're out of fellowship with God. And then he says, part of the problem here is your pride. Your pride. Is pride a problem? Yes, pride is a problem. We're too proud to ask for forgiveness. We're too proud to say, I'm sorry. We're too proud to say, I was wrong. We're too proud to say, I messed up. We're too proud to humble ourselves before a holy God and say, forgive me. The reason this floor up here is bone dry It's because it's probably been years, if ever, that it's been soaked and stained with the tears of God's people who have confessed and repented of known sin. And we have families and children and grandchildren that don't know God. And we've gotten comfortable with that. Some of you folks that are older than me, I'm not calling you old, by the way, okay? Remember the time, and I'm not wanting to go back to the way it used to be. I'm glad I got indoor plumbing, aren't you? Amen. But there used to be a mourner's bench in the church. And it was stained with the tears of God's people who agonized over personal sin and brokenness in their own lives and the brokenness of their family and their friends and their neighbors and the culture in which they lived. Long gone are those days because we've been sucked into our culture. I'm okay, and you're okay. Let's just give one another a hug. You 
You see, this is living reality. Are we friends of God? Are we enemies of God? And James is saying, you can't be a friend of the world and be a friend of God. So he calls the church to repentance. Now, when's the last time you heard a lot about repentance? There are several imperatives beginning at verse 7 in the fourth chapter that cause us to repentance. I will tell you, if there was ever a time in the history of the church in America, in North America, in Southern Baptist, and across denominational lines, that there need to be repentance, it, it's now. And we're praying and praying and praying for a mighty move of God to sweep across our land. But it's going to start in the church house among God's people who get broken over their sin and repent. Now, going to start out in the world with the pagans. And I want to tell you, if we're looking for Washington to fix the problems in America, you're looking in the wrong place. If there's help for us, it's in God and God alone. And it will come when we are bending our knees and on our faces before a holy God in extraordinary prayer, in brokenness, through the means of repentance, that we're seeking the face of God to God move upon us. So we need to repent. And James is saying, you're at enmity with God. You're at enmity with one another. You're out of fellowship with God. You're out of fellowship with one another. Your pride is keeping you hostage. You need to repent. And so he says, here's what you have to do. In verse 7, he says, you need to submit to God. Submit. And what does that word mean, submit? It is a decisive, urgent, clearly focused act to arrange or place one thing under another. A voluntary willingness to align oneself under the authority of another. We will to submit our lives and our total being under the authority of God, under the authority of the Lordship of Jesus Christ. We submit to God. Have we submitted to God? For Him to reign and rule in our lives and in our hearts. It's easy to get caught up in the church thing and come to church and check off the box. I did church. God's pleased with me. I did church. God's pleased with me. There's more to it than that. It's about a personal walk and a personal relationship and us submitting to God. We need to submit. We need to submit. He says, not only do you need to submit to God in verse 7, he says, you need to resist the devil. Now, it's not to say that we can blame the devil like Geraldine did about sin and say, the devil made me do it, old Flip Wilson. But we understand that that the devil brings temptation. There's a supernatural activity in temptation, and we must oppose the devil. We must resist the devil. But we must be so connected to the Spirit of God and the mind of God that we're aware of the, of the satanic, demonic activity that would lead us into temptation. And how does he do it? He does it in the mind. So if you're not in the Word of God, fixing your mind on the Word of God, being programmed, and I don't like that word because we're not being programmed, but our hearts are being changed and molded and made to the image of Christ Jesus. If we're not being transformed into the mind of Christ and having the mind of Christ, those various things we're putting in our mind that is worldly and secular and sensual begin to shape us and shape us and mold us, and the enemy uses that stuff to bring temptation into our hearts and our life. He works on the mind. He did that with Eve in the garden. Or he works on the will. Or he works on the body. Remember, Job had all those problems and all that, that pain and all that agony. And his wife said, curse God and die. And the enemy says, all these troubles you got, all these problems you got, you think you're a friend of God. You think God loves you. Curse God and die. The enemy brings all that temptation and all that trouble, and he wants you to walk away from God. We have to resist the devil. Jesus did that. He used Scripture to resist the devil. He prayed for the strength of God, the power of God in the Garden of Eden. He prayed for help, or the Garden of Gethsemane, rather. He prayed for help. Resist the devil. We have to resist the devil. 
So we submit, we resist the devil, and he says, draw near to God, return. In the process of repentance and being renewed in mind and heart and spirit, we have to draw near to God. We have to return, draw near to God. But here's the problem. You can't draw near to God and return to God if you've not come to the realization that there has been a departure from God. And most of us, we're this way. I'm okay. You're okay. Let's just hug each other. You love God. I love God. We love each other. Hooray! But do we hate sin as God hates sin? And do we have a passion to be in the Word of God every day? And do we have a passion to pray for missionaries and pray for a world that needs the gospel? And do we have a passion to see God move in our lives and move in our hearts? Move upon our nation. So we have to recognize there's been a departure from God. I want to ask you a question. In your own personal estimation, I know we're biased as we do this. But in your own personal estimation, do you feel that you're closer to God today than you were this time last year? And you can't base it on feelings. But as you look at the course of your life, do you think, I, I'm growing spiritually, I'm growing spiritually, I'm getting closer to God? Or has there become a disconnect where you're just feeling kind of numb toward the things of God? You're just kind of going through the motions. God doesn't want us to say the same. God wants us to keep growing. For salvation is a continuous process. I was saved when I was nine. I'm being saved today. I will continue to be saved. The work of transformation and is taking place in my heart. Sanctification is taking place. And I'm to be growing in grace and the knowledge of the Lord. But we have to recognize there's been a departure. And that's the problem. My mother used to say to my dad, Frank, you have a drinking problem. And my dad says, Eudora, I don't have a drinking problem. And my mother would say, Frank, you have a problem with alcohol. And he would say, Eudora, shut up. I don't have a problem with alcohol. But he did. And I'd watch my mother drag him through the hall and put his head in the toilet so he would not choke on his own vomit. He had a problem with alcohol. But he refused to acknowledge it. And then he got high and mighty and said, when I want to stop, what? I can stop. No, he couldn't. It took the unction of God and the power of God on his life and him recognizing he had a problem. And God set him free. We have to recognize there's been a departure from God. In the book of Hosea chapter 14, God says to the nation of Israel, you have left me, there's been a departure from me, you need to acknowledge you have departed and left me. You need to say to the work of our hands, you are our gods, we'll no longer worship the things we make with our hands, but we will worship you, O oh God. And God says, if you'll repent and turn to me, I will be as the dew and there will be refreshing waters and you will be replenished and refreshed when you repent and turn to me. We have to draw near to God. We have to repent. We have to return. We have to acknowledge. And when we take a step toward God, he's already taking steps toward us. It's like the prodigal son getting out of the hog pen and running toward his father at home. And there he finds his father with open arms to receive him. Listen to me. God is more willing to send awakening to this nation than we could ever imagine. God wants it. But he's waiting on us. There are conditions that must be exactly right for it to happen. In the 14th chapter of the book of Hosea, he says, If you will return to me, draw near to me, I will be as to do. Now, you've heard me say this. I had an agriculture guy say to me one time when I was right out of seminary, Preacher, does do rise or fall? I said, Is this a trick question? No, I'm just asking about the do. Does do rise or fall? I said, well, I'd assume it falls. Now, he never told me one way or the other if it rise or fall. 
But you know what he said? When conditions are right, the dew distills itself over everything. And when you walk out in the morning and you look at the grass and the sunlight hits it, it looks like a diamond sparkling in the grass. That's the dew. Has to do with atmosphere. Has to do with conditions. God says, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then, when, then, when, then, I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin. And I will heal their land. Return. Return. And he says, when you return, you cleanse your hands you purify your hands. You cleanse your hands. The priests were always washing their hands in the Old Testament. Always in a golden laver, lest they die. But the washing of the hands was so much more than simply washing with water because they understood their hearts need to be cleansed before God. The psalmist said in Psalm 24, 3, Who shall ascend to the hill of the Lord? Who shall stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart. We have to wash our hands. We have to purify our hearts. Come clean. Isaiah says in 118, Come, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red as crimson, they shall be as wool. Come, let us reason together. That's what God's saying to us, church. Come. Let's reason together. Return to me, and I will be as the dew. Cleanse your hearts, purify your soul. And you notice the charge that was made in this passage? He says, draw near to me, and I will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts. He says to them, you double-minded. Cleanse your hands, purify your hearts. You double-minded. What does that mean, double-minded? It means you're two-souled. What's that mean? You're one thing on Sunday. You're something else on Monday. Two-souled. You're not consistent. You're not real. You're playing a game. You're going through the motions. You're two-souled. You have just enough religion to bug you rather than bless you. You know what you're doing is wrong, but you don't have the power to stop. You're two-souled. And God says, you don't need to be two-souled. You need to be sold out to me and me alone. Cleanse your hands. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Divided Christian, two-souled, must repent of spiritual adultery. And you know what he says here? Feel. I want to read this to you. I know the hour's getting there. Just hang in there. Verse 9, he says, Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. He says, Be wretched. You know, the Apostle Paul always referred to himself as wretched. Oh, wretched man that I am. I don't care how long you are in Christ Jesus, you will have a sin nature. Now we are people of a new nature and the old nature no longer reigns in our bodies. But there is the possibility and the probability that we will sin and break the heart of God. The problem is when we get comfortable with it, and we think nothing of it. And our hearts are not broken over our sin. Sin breaks the heart of God. He says, wretched man. Wretched man. Acknowledge you're a wretched man. Acknowledge you're a worm. Acknowledge that you're sinful. Mourn and weep. It's godly sorrow. Paul talks about it in 1 Corinthians. It's godly sorrow. It's not sorrow that you got caught. That's William Jefferson Clinton. Just acknowledging, yeah, there was a woman named Monica Lewinsky. 
But we didn't have sex. It just depends how you define the word is. That's not godly sorrow. Godly sorrow is to recognize I am a wretched individual. I have sinned against a holy God and my sin put his son on the cross to die for my sin. And when I live in sin and get comfortable in sin, woe be unto us because then we are trotting under our feet the precious blood of the Lord Jesus. So mourn and weep and be grieved in your heart. I saw a picture on Facebook just a little while ago. And Facebook's not bad, you understand that? But it can't control you, you have to control it. It was from five years ago, it's a picture of me walking in the snow at Emory University Hospital. I had walked over to Panera Bread to get us lunch. And it was the beginning of our five-year battle of cancer. And they told us Matt wouldn't live a year, probably less than a year. And I can't tell you how many days I would put my pillow, a face in my pillow and cry and cry and plead and plead with a holy God that he intervened in the life of my son and save him and cancer wouldn't kill him. And I'd wake up at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning and I didn't want to wake Deborah up. And I'd, we, I'd just bury my face in the pillow. My pillow every morning would be wet as it could be. And one morning in my quiet time, God said to me, would that you desire a relationship with me as much as you desire for me to heal your son. And I was broken and deeply grieved. We need to grieve over our sin. It breaks the heart of God. It breaks the heart of God. And there is no penance until there's deep grief over our sin. And we're comfortable in our sin, church. We're just comfortable. Our culture is comfortable in sin. A senator can take picture of body parts in New York and put them on Facebook and he gets caught and he simply says, oh well, I'm sorry. And so everything's okay? Doesn't look like godly sorrow to me. It's when we weep. And so I ask you a question. How long has it been since the, the altar has been soaked in the tears of God's people because they've grieved over sin? How long has it been the pillow that you put your head down on at night has been soaked in your tears because you're grieving over the sin of your life, over the sin in the lives of your children and grandchildren? Grieved. God says, this is the problem. Turn to me. Respond with mourning and weeping. Mourn and weep. Now, we don't, we don't do that, do we? Why? We got too much pride. I don't want nobody to see me crying. Men don't cry. You just bought a bill of goods from the devil. When your heart's broken over sin, I don't care if you're six foot four, weigh 320 pounds, you'll cry like a baby when God deals with you. And you notice what he says, mourn and grieve and weep. And there will be a deep grief that can't be concealed in its intensity. You notice he says something. I want you to look at me. I'm almost done. I want you to look at this. Be wretched and mourn and reap. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. There's nothing wrong with laughter. There's nothing wrong with joy. But can I tell you there are people sitting in here today that can be the life of the party and they can laugh and have all kind of joy, but when they're alone, they're most miserable because they've experienced deep hurt and heartache in their life and they don't know how to ask anybody to pray with them and they don't know how to acknowledge it to God or they have too much pride to acknowledge to God. They're the life of the party, laughing and laughing and making jokes and carrying on, but probably so miserable, so miserable on the inside and they don't have the heart or the humility to confess and ask God to help. Let your laughter be torn to grieving. 
I'll tell you what's going to happen. When our hearts get broken and we get broken as a people, we'll let our laughter be turned to mourning and our joy to grief and our, our, our behavior will change, our emotions will change because the power of God and the Spirit of God will move upon us and the, and the, and the virtue that's required for all of this to happen is humility. Humility. We have to humble ourselves before God. Now, what's God saying to you? I, I want to ask you this. I just want you to, to bow your heads just for a moment. Brian, you'll come get ready. I want to ask you a few questions this morning. Would you stand just for a moment? As you assess your place here at Bethany, does it seem like you're the person that always initiates the conflict or the strife? I don't think we have that in our church at all. So maybe it's not at here, but maybe it's at home. It's my way. It's got to be my way. It's got to be the way I want it. Is that you? Or maybe you've been given over to a critical spirit, and you're always um, seem to be critical. Critical about life, critical about things at church, critical about staff people, critical about the deacon, critical about the Sunday school teacher, critical about the Sunday school, critical about your family, critical about a son or daughter, critical about your spouse. Maybe you've got taken on such a critical spirit because you're out of fellowship with God. Do my values differ from my neighbors who are not Christian? To have a different attitude toward the world of God, uh, toward the Word of God than than that guy I worked with that's not a Christian? Do I have a different attitude about the world and culture than that person I work with who's not a child of God? Or do we look just alike? Can there be no obvious difference? Is there no obvious difference in us? He doesn't even go to church, doesn't know God. Do I look like him, resemble him? Is my attitude one of self-examination where I am deliberately seeking God and deliberately trying to repent and deliberately trying to become more like the Savior through humility and repentance? Is my life filled with loud, noisy laughter, but actually I have on a mask covering up the pain in my heart, but I don't want to acknowledge to God that I'm hurting and I need help? Is that you today? Father, in these moments, I pray the power of the Holy Spirit would move upon us. Jesus, walk in this room today. May your people respond as you prompt them to respond. And Lord, this is your work and your business. Whether anybody comes or not, that, you know, that's not what I'm about up here. Noah preached for 120 years. Nobody ever responded. That's not what this is about. This is your work. This is your purpose. These are your people. It's only as you move upon their heart and deal with pride that people respond. But, Lord, I pray you deal with each and every one of us and we be obedient to the prompt of your spirit, that we be broken over our sin and broken over our comfortable spirit in a world of sinfulness and we just go along our merry way. Everything's okay. And yet, yet things are not okay. Forgive us, Jesus, when we look more like the culture than we look like you. In Jesus' name, amen.